Ya. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone. This is the third edition of this uh, newly begun uh, uh, online seminar series, Gauge Gravity by the Ghats. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, this uh, we started the series here at CHEP last month. And uh, the idea was to provide like a common platform for experts from the fields of gauge theories and gravity so that they'd have like a you know, place to discuss and listen to you know, uh, the latest research in the field and hopefully lead to you know, future collaborations and other research activities. So uh, we've had two talks so far. We had uh, Yuya Panizaki from Kyoto University and we had uh, Jean-Luc Lenners from MPI Potsdam. And we are very happy today to have Arnoz Joseph, who is uh, at the University of the Witwatersrand, Bits University. So uh, he, Arnoz will be telling us about uh, uh, complex Langevin and Lipschitz thimble methods for complex actions. Uh, before we begin, so Arnoz, uh, he, uh, um, he, he did his PhD from uh, Syracuse University. His uh, uh, advisor was uh, Simon Catterall. After that, he uh, did quite a few postdocs, and um, he did postdocs in Los Alamos, in Daisy Zoyton, in Cambridge, Cambridge. Finally, before moving back to India as a postdoc, where he was uh, next door to us at ICTS in Bangalore. Then uh, a few years ago, he joined Isa Mohali as a faculty. And early this year, he moved to Witwatersrand University, where he's uh, uh, presently based. So uh, Anush, uh, uh, over to you. And uh, before, I mean, uh, before, you know, uh, before we begin the seminar, um, if someone has some questions, uh, post it in the chat and uh, one of us will uh, notice it and uh, uh, ask the speaker. Uh, as far as possible, unless the question is really important, uh, please wait, please wait till the end of the talk. We do this because um, uh, this is an online seminar and people are in different time zones. So we like to finish it by, you know, we like to finish it within the scheduled time so as to make it convenient for everyone. So we don't, uh, as far as possible, let's not interrupt the flow of the talk and we can have all the questions uh, at the end of the talk. So uh, with that, Anush, uh, welcome. Happy to have you with us and good to see you again. And yeah, uh, over to you. Okay, thanks Prasad for a very nice introduction. Uh, so the title of my talk is Complex Langevin and uh, Lipschitz Thimble Methods for Complex Actions. So let me begin with uh, the motivation. So the question is, where do we encounter complex actions? Uh, so there are many places where we see complex actions. Um, so one is real-time simulations, uh, Minkowski space-time. Uh, we can we need to directly uh, simulate the theory where uh, we encounter complex action. Then uh, QCD at uh, finite baryon or quark uh, density, uh, that is QCD at finite chemical potential. Then uh, Chan Simons theory. Uh, it is extremely difficult to put Chan Simons theory on a lattice uh, and simulate. Uh, then uh, Young Mills theory with uh, the topological, the theta term, then many uh, situations in condensed matter theory, then quantum many body systems. Um, so it would be interesting if we have some machinery to, um, to study, to extract the physics of uh, theories with complex actions. Okay, now coming to high energy physics. Uh, so here is a sketch of the phase diagram uh, of QCD. Uh, so on the y-axis, we have the temperature, and on the x-axis, we have the chemical potential. And uh, on this phase diagram, we can see different phases. Uh, so there is a hydronic phase uh, here. Then there is a critical point, which uh, we still have to determine you know, where the critical point is exactly. Then there is a phase where we see nuclear matter. Then uh, towards the higher end of the chemical potential, we see color superconductor phase. Then we have quark gluon plasma phase. Um, so here, uh, if we want to simulate uh, this theory, QCD with the uh, finite chemical potential, uh, Monte Carlo has um, problem. Uh, so it is not easy. Um, 
so our goal is to uh, determine the phase diagram of QCD non perturbatively um, So the question is, is it possible? Uh, we know that uh, at low temperature and uh, small chemical potential, QCD is confining. Uh, so we have hadrons there. And uh, maybe we could use uh, lattice QCD to simulate the theory in this region. Um, so it is well known that when chemical potential is zero and uh, temperature is non-zero, um, lattice QCD works very well. So we have hot QCD collaboration, you know, several other collaborations um, exploring the phase diagram uh, at finite temperature. Now, if you look at uh, the formulation of lattice QCD, it is based on important sampling. Uh, so this is a numerical integration uh, in the field configuration space. And uh, we are uh, picking out the configurations that are most relevant. Um, I mean, so that is why it is called the important sampling. And uh, this is based on Markov chain Monte Carlo. So it is a Monte Carlo method, uh, but there is a chain, which is a Markov chain. And uh, the, the chain starts at uh, an arbitrary field configuration and eventually the, the chain finds its uh, equilibrium uh, configuration where action is minimized. Uh, but when the chemical potential is non-zero, the important sampling method breaks down. So let's see uh, how this thing happens. Uh, so we consider uh, a theory with uh, non-zero chemical potential. So let's look at a simple example where we have quantum chromodynamics with uh, one flavor of fermions. Uh, so the partition function on the lattice, it has this particular form. Uh, so here psi bar and psi, these are fermions. Then uh, here U is the gauge link. Uh, so the gauge field is represented as this uh, link fields connecting um, between two neighboring sites on the lattice. Uh, so this is the partition function. Uh, we can integrate over these uh, fermions, psi bar and psi. Um, and what we get is a determinant of, of this uh, fermion operator. So here M is the, the fermion matrix or the Dirac operator. So uh, in important sampling, what we do is um, we take this object, uh, this exponential of minus of the bosonic action times the determinant um, as a probability weight. So we are sampling the configurations based on this probability. Uh, so we can interpret this as a probability only when this entire object is real and positive. So suppose the determinant of M is complex, then uh, we have a problem. And if the bosonic part of the action is complex, again, we have a problem. We cannot interpret uh, this object as a probability. So, um, uh, so as I mentioned before, when uh, there is chemical potential, uh, QCD, the action becomes uh, complex. And this is coming through the fact that the fermion determinant is complex. So we have this relation between uh, for the fermion determinant. Uh, if you take the complex conjugate um, and uh, uh, it transforms in this way, and uh, which is uh, not real, it is complex. So in other words, uh, we can say that the theory has a sign problem, or in general, the theory has a, a, fa a complex phase problem. Um, so uh, this is the reason for uh, the important sampling um, to break down in Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, now, what we can do is we can express the determinant, this complex determinant of the fermion operator as a real part and a phase. Uh, then one immediate solution to this uh, sign problem or complex phase problem is, uh, uh, is that we can absorb this phase in, inside the observable. Suppose we have an observable which is made out of uh, the, the microscopic degrees of freedom. Uh, then we can find the expectation value of this observable in this way. This is nothing but the path integral formalism where we take the expectation value of an observable. Now, if the determinant of the matrix is complex, uh, we separate the determinant into this polar decomposition, the real part and the phase part. Then we treat exponential i phi times observable as a new observable. And we sample this using this real action. Okay, now what is remaining is the real probability weight. 
And we sample this so it, it becomes the ratio of uh, two observables. One is the phase multiplied by the observable and the other is the phase itself. And uh, this sampling is called the phase quenched sampling or phase quenched Monte Carlo simulation. Now let's look at this uh, object, the phase, which we saw in the denominator here. Um, so we can express this phase as the uh, ratio of two partition functions. One is the full partition function where the phase is included and the other is the partition function without the phase. That is the partition function phase quenched, PQ. And this can be expressed as um, exponential of, uh, so from thermodynamics, we know that it is, the, the integral is exponential of minus uh, uh, beta F, where F is the free energy. Uh, so here this delta F is, the, uh, is a free energy density. Uh, so delta F is free energy, the difference, de the difference of the free energy densities between uh, the full theory and the phase quench theory. And uh, it is multiplied by the space-time volume, which is denoted as omega. And we can show that always the full partition function is less than or equal to the phase quench partition function. Now, in the thermodynamic limit, that is when we take the lattice volume to infinity, that is what we do in lattice field theory simulations, by the, at the end of the simulations, we take the volume uh, to infinity and the light spacing to zero. Uh, so in the thermodynamic limit, if uh, the full free energy density is not the same as the, not equal to the, uh, the phase quench free energy density, um, then this ratio is not well defined. Uh, so the numerator and denominator in this ratio, they vanish exponentially as we increase the lattice volume. Uh, so there is an exponential dependence on, on the lattice volume uh, on this for this observable. Um, so then uh, we say that the sign problem is exponentially hard. So as we uh, increase the volume of the, uh, the lattice theory, the sign problem becomes extremely hard. So the, the error or the, or the noise increases and uh, the signal um, disappears within the noise. Um, so that is the sign problem. Uh, it is also known as the zero over zero problem. Okay, now coming to the complex Langevin method. So let me give uh, a brief introduction uh, or a brief overview of uh, complex Langevin method. Um, complex Langevin dynamics, uh, sorry, the, let's look at the real Langevin dynamics. Uh, so the real Langevin dynamics, it is a fancy modification of uh, path integral quantization. Um, so what happens is we can interpret the, the Euclidean path integral measure, which is given by this exponential of minus uh, of the action uh, multiplied by one over the partition function. We can interpret this as an equilibrium distribution of a stochastic process. Um, so there is a process that is running in some fictitious time. And uh, in the large time limit, we recover this uh, probability weight, okay, this, uh, this object, the Euclidean path integral measure. So now the question is, how do we implement uh, the Langevin dynamics? So we want to make the system evolve in a fictitious time, uh, which I denote as theta, uh, and this evolution is subject to a stochastic noise. And uh, this evolution respects Langevin dynamics, so there is an associated uh, uh, probability distribution, um, which I will show soon. Um, so before that, uh, let's look at a toy model example. So let's consider a toy model in, uh, in zero dimensions. That means space time is just a point or we are doing everything at one lattice side. Um, so the, the action is given by this. So there is a quadratic term in this, in this object phi, which we can take as a, this object as a scalar field. Um, then there are two couplings, sigma and uh, lambda. Uh, now we want to evolve this field phi in this fictitious uh, time direction. Um, so then uh, the Langevin dynamics is for this field phi, it is given by this differential equation. So the rate of change of the field phi in this fictitious parameter theta is given by the negative of the gradient of the action with respect to the field. And this is called the drift or the friction term in analogy with the, 
um, Brownian motion. Uh, then there is a noise uh, term, which is uh, the kick term, again, in analogy with Brownian motion. So we can uh, loosely consider this, uh, the first term as the classical part and the second term as the quantum part. So the quantization or stochastic quantization is coming from this noise part. So the noise, it obeys uh, certain constraints. So the constraints are the noise, the average should be zero. So it's a Gaussian noise with the mean zero and the width should obey this constraint, okay? Um, so it is a particular type of noise. Now uh, we evolved the field in, uh, in this uh, time direction. Uh, so we get uh, new field configurations as the lunch one time progresses. And uh, this entire evolution is controlled uh, by a probability distribution, which uh, is denoted as this. Uh, and this probability distribution or probability density, uh, it obeys a differential equation, which is uh, the Fokker-Planck equation. And this equation is given by this. Now, in the large uh, time limit, when theta goes to infinity, this probability distribution becomes independent of the Langevin time. And that is the stationary distribution of the system. Um, and we can uh, take uh, measurements uh, in the large Langevin time. Now, similar to the path integral uh, approach, uh, we can uh, write down the expectation value of an observable in this way. Uh, so it is weighted by this probability weight. Uh, now, assuming ergodicity, we can show that in the large uh, time limit, the probability density approaches the Euclidean path integral measure or the Boltzmann weight in a canonical ensemble. Um, so for finite theta, there are additional terms. There are additional distributions uh, coming into the picture, but they all uh, go like, they all die away exponentially. So this distribution is reached exponentially fast as uh, theta increases. Okay, now once the system is in equilibrium, so here on this plot on the right-hand side, I am showing uh, an observable, a generic observable, which uh, the initial starting point could be anywhere. And eventually it, it will find the equilibrium distribution and it will fluctuate around there. Then uh, once the equilibrium is reached, we can remove the initial part, which is called the thermalization. Um, and uh, we can compute the average of this and the error on this that would give the value of the observable and the associated uh, numerical error. Now here is another uh, schematic uh, sketch. Uh, I mean, this is coming from a simulation uh, of a theory where uh, the fields are evolving so this is a case of complex Langevin, um, where we start with an initial distribution, then uh, from in an initial field configuration, and the field is slowly finding its way uh, to the equilibrium configuration. And once it is there, it simply fluctuates around there, so forming a cloud. Okay, now making Langevin complex. Uh, so complex Langevin dynamics is a formal extension of the real Langevin dynamics. So it was introduced by Parisi and Clouder in, in the early 80s. Um, so here what happens is uh, we analytically continue the real field to a complex, a complex field. So it has a real part and an imaginary part. And the observable is also continued analytically, uh, which has a real part and oh, an imaginary part. Then uh, the noise is made complex. It also has real and imaginary parts. And there will be a complex uh, stochastic equation, which uh, we can separate into two parts. So uh, there are two Langevin processes, uh, one uh, for the real part of the field and the other for the imaginary part of the field. And uh, here also the noise terms, they obey certain constraints, which are given by this. Uh, and uh, there is a normalization factor. There are two of them, NR and NI. And there is a constraint between the two, which is given by this, nr minus ni, it must be one. And ni can be greater than or equal to zero. It can take any value, but in practice, we take nr equal to one and ni equal to zero. Uh, now coming to the observables. So we can write the expectation value of a holomorphic observable in two different ways. One is in the real field configuration space, so as I mentioned before, the action is complex. 
but uh, the degrees of freedom, the fields, they are real. Um, so we can, uh, so in the second equation, in the red colored equation, so there is a density, there's a probability density, which is complex, but the observable is real, which is made out of real fields. And uh, another description is we have a two dimensional probability distribution, which is real and positive definite. And uh, we have analytical continuation of the observable. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned before, uh, so this uh, probability density, which is made out, uh, uh, which is dependent on the real and imaginary part of, parts of the field, um, that is a real positive probability distribution. Um, so the problem is finding this distribution. So, so far, uh, there is, nobody has found an, uh, an analytical way of uh, writing down this equilibrium distribution. So there are some, uh, a handful of examples for some simple models, we can find this probability distribution, but for uh, all the interesting models, it is not possible. Uh, but we can find this distribution numerically, but there is no analytical, uh, so far there is no analytical uh, solution. Now coming to the, the second way of expressing this, we have a complex weight and we have the real observable. Uh, and the, com the weight, the complex nature of the weight is coming from uh, the complex action. So it is roughly exponential of minus s, where s is complex. Okay, now complex Langevin is justified if these two, if the expectation value is computed uh, using these two processes uh, are equal. Uh, but this is not yet proved in, in full generality. It is proved in certain cases. Uh, so as I mentioned before, it is extremely difficult to find this uh, stationary distribution uh, of these two independent variables, phi r and phi i. Uh, so what we look for is certain um, correctness criteria. So how this, this two-dimensional probability distribution should fall off in imaginary directions. Uh, so, and if they fall off in a certain way, if they behave in a certain way, then we can trust the complex Langevin method. And uh, there are several um, papers uh, in the literature where people, they have justified the use of complex Langevin dynamics, uh, showing that they respect the correctness criteria. Okay, now let me move on to the application of uh, complex Langevin dynamics. So the first application is models with supersymmetry. Uh, so this is based on the work I did with uh, Arpit, uh, Arpit was my first PhD student at Isa Mohali. Now Arpit is doing his postdoc uh, at uh, Central China Normal University. Um, so, so I gave this problem to Arpit as part of his uh, PhD. Um, so studying supersymmetric quantum mechanics using uh, complex lunch one dynamics. Um, so uh, let's consider uh, the, the action of this supersymmetric quantum mechanics. This, nothing but uh, Witten's uh, supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Uh, so we have uh, two fermions, psi and psi bar, and there is a scalar field. Uh, the action is given by this. Uh, then W is the superpotential. It could be any function of phi, the scalar field. And uh, we introduced uh, an auxiliary field, uh, which is related to the scalar field phi. Uh, now this action has a symmetry. It is invariant under two, uh, fermionic uh, charges, Q and Q bar, and the symmetry is supersymmetry. Um, so Q on S equal to zero, Q bar on S equal to zero. That means the action is invariant under these two supersymmetry charges. Uh, so we can write down the partition function in the path integral formalism in this way. Now our goal is to study uh, dynamical Susi breaking or non perturbative Susi breaking in this theory. So if you look at the, the action or the Lagrangian, we see that uh, it respects supersymmetry, but uh, the SUSI can be broken uh, dynamically. And uh, we need a non perturbative formalism to probe this, whether SUSI is broken or not in the theory. Uh, so what we do is uh, we can study various theories with uh, complex uh, superpotentials so that the action becomes complex. Uh, and uh, we study that using uh, this method of complex Langevin dynamics. So let's uh, put this theory on a lattice because we are doing a numerical simulation. 
so the action can be complex in general because the superpotential W of phi can be complex. Uh, so we will use complex Lange 1 dynamics. If the action is real, we can use real Lange 1 or we can use Marco chain Monte Carlo. Now let's discretize this uh, quantum mechanics on a one dimension lattice. Uh, so the lattice is given by this, the figure on the top right hand side. Uh, so we have T number of equally spaced sides with the lattice spacing A. The physical extent of the lattice is beta, which is T times A. Um, then uh, we change continuous derivatives into difference operators. Now we do all this magic and everything. And what we get is the lattice action for our theory, which takes this particular form. And here, this object is the symmetric difference operator. Uh, then there are terms containing the superpotential. And we added a Wilson mass term to the lattice action because on the lattice, we have the fermion doubling problem, which is a lattice artifact. And we want to uh, control that problem. So for that, uh, we add the Wilson term. This term was introduced by Wilson back in the days when he studied uh, non-abelian gauge theories. Uh, now, this particular lattice action respects half of the supersymmetry. So this action is invariant under the Q supercharge, but it is not invariant under the Q bar supercharge. Now, when supersymmetry is broken, the partition function vanishes. So that is a problem. Uh, so when we compute expectation values of observables, uh, the expectation value is normalized by the partition function. And if the partition function vanishes, the entire thing blows up, so it is ill-defined. Uh, so we need to overcome this difficulty. Uh, so what we do is uh, we apply something called twisted boundary conditions for fermions. So we apply, we introduce periodic boundary conditions for the bosons, the scalar field, and uh, twisted boundary conditions for the fermions uh, by introducing a twist parameter, which we denote as alpha. And uh, eventually we take the twist going to zero limit there it becomes periodic again. Um, now, imposing twisted boundary conditions is same as introducing an external field in the system. So it, is, uh, it has been introduced in, in many places. Um, for example, in the lattice QCD, at, uh, uh, suppose we want to tune the momentum uh, that, you know, of a quark or something, so we can introduce twisted boundary conditions there. Um, now, the two boundary conditions are given by this. For the scalar field, we have the periodic boundary condition. And for the fermions, we have we introduce a phase, exponential i alpha, where alpha is the twist parameter. Then the partition function, it becomes this uh, modified partition function. The only change is the boundary conditions for the fermions are uh, modified using this parameter alpha. Now, the expectation value of the observable is the same as what we see in the path integral uh, approach. Um, we can compute the expectation value numerically through this. Now, what are the observables of this theory? Uh, so we have, we can compute the mass gaps uh, from correlators. We have bosonic and fermionic correlation functions on the lattice. They are given by this. And we can fit these correlators to exponentials or, or cosh, and we can extract the, the mass gap in, in the theory. Then another observable is the auxiliary field itself. Uh, we can measure this field, and uh, this uh, can predict whether there is SUSI breaking or not. If uh, in the alpha going to zero limit, the, the, if this observable is not zero, then supersymmetry is broken. If the observable is zero, then SUSI is preserved in the theory. Then another observable is the bosonic action itself uh, on the lattice. Uh, it has this particular form. And uh, through uh, using equipartition theorem, one can show that the full action should be the same as the number of lattice sites. And the bosonic action should carry half of uh, one half of T. It should, if uh, supersymmetry is preserved, uh, and if you measure the bosonic action, we should get one half of the number of sites. Otherwise, uh, it is broken. Then another observable is, another set of observables is ward identities. Uh, so this is a general way of showing, uh, deriving ward identities. Uh, so by the invariance, by looking at the invariance of the partition function under supersymmetric transformations. Uh, so we introduce sources here for the fields. Um, 
then we look at the variation of this the partition function and apply the supercharge on it and what we get is uh, a constraint so here a constraint connecting the fermion correlator with the uh, a variant of the boson correlator and we can measure these two objects separately on the lattice and if one is opposite of the other then the wider identity is respected so we can use this uh, uh, this observable also to check uh, spontaneous OC breaking. Okay, now let's uh, look at some simple models. So we start with the double well potential. So we already know the answer to this. Uh, so the super potential has this particular form. It looks like a double well and the supersymmetry is dynamically broken in this model, although the Lagrangian is invariant, uh, although the action is invariant and not supersymmetry. Uh, so now since we have the complex Langevin dynamics, the complex Langevin method in our hand, we can also consider a complexified double well potential, which is given by this. So here also the field phi is real, but we made the coupling complex. G uh, becomes I times G. Now, these are the simulation results uh, after complex line one simulations. So here on the left-hand side, we have the expectation value of the, the observable B and uh, against the lunch one time. I have removed the thermalization part. So now everything is in equilibrium. So fluctuating around the equilibrium distribution. Um, so here we see that this observable B, it does not fluctuate around uh, zero. Uh, so that means um, supersymmetry is broken in this model with the double well potential. Now, the another observable, which is the bosonic action. So we, we can see that how it behaves against lunch one time. Again, it is not one half of the number of lattice sites. So again, supersymmetry is broken uh, in this model. Um, now, if you look at the complex double well potential, we see that uh, the observable B is fluctuating around zero and the bosonic action is one half of the number of lattice sites. So we used a lattice with eight sites. So we have, the bosonic action fluctuating around four. If you take uh, the mean value, uh, we will see that it's four plus or minus something. Now, again, what identities? Uh, on the left-hand side, we have the case for the, uh, the real potential. And on the right-hand side, we have the complex double well potential. So we see that the ward identity is broken on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, for the complex potential, it is nicely satisfied. So there are. So we are looking at all these observables and uh, you know concluding that uh, um, supersymmetry is dynamically broken in uh, real double well potential, and uh, it is preserved in complex double well potential. Okay. Then after that, we moved on to a theory with the PT symmetry. Uh, so these theories are getting a lot of attention recently. Uh, so these are non-Hermitian quantum theories, but uh, uh, the boundary conditions are uh, PT symmetric. Instead of periodic boundary conditions, uh, the boundary conditions respect uh, P and T. Uh, but uh, the spectrum of the theory is still real. The eigenvalues are real. Uh, so we consider a particular type of superpotential. Uh, here, this parameter delta is a continuous parameter, and this is a, a PT symmetric uh, superpotential. Um, now, supersymmetric Lagrangian for this model, it breaks p-symmetry. Parity is broken in this model. And we can ask if uh, breaking of p-symmetry, uh, does it induce a spontaneous breaking of supersymmetry? We can ask this question. Uh, so this question was asked uh, a long time ago. Uh, and uh, it was, so, uh, so there they used uh, perturbation theory to study this and the perturbative analysis in delta for small delta values, the result was supersymmetry is not spontaneously broken in these models. Now we have complex lunch one method in hand, and we can ask uh, for any delta. It doesn't have to be a small delta. Uh, for any delta, can we study this non pervertively and uh, check whether SUSI is broken or not? So that is what we did. Uh, so we did the simulations for various delta values. So on the right-hand side, top, we have delta equal to two, bottom, we have delta equal to three, and for various couplings. Um, and we see that uh, SUSI is preserved in this model, again, for uh, large deltas. 
so these are the wired identities. They are nicely satisfied uh, for delta equal to two and delta equal to three. Um, yeah, so in this particular superpotential, um, supersymmetry is preserved in this uh, model. Okay, now coming uh, coming to the reliability of uh, complex management method, uh, how do we how do we check that uh, our simulations are reliable? Um, so the probability distribution, the two dimensional probability distribution, it should decay sufficiently fast in imaginary directions. So to see that uh, we can, there are two correctness criteria. One is we can check the Fokker-Planck equation itself. So the probability distribution obeys a uh, it it becomes if it exists if the solution exists uh, it obeys this uh, differential equation um, then uh, we can check how fast the the drift term in the Langevin process how fast it decays um, so we we can do the checks if uh, if you look at the Fokker Planck equation uh, so the holomorphic observables of the theory uh, so we measure them at each lattice side and we apply the Langevin operator on this. Uh, and we should get zero. So once equilibrium distribution is reached, uh, so this uh, the expectation value of the Langevin operator acting on the observable should fluctuate around zero. So we can use this as a criterion for correctness uh, of the complex Langevin method. Uh, so we we took this auxiliary field as an observable and we measured this. Uh, so they are nicely fluctuating around zero. So this is one way to justify the, the use of complex Langevin uh, method. And the other is the decay of the drift terms. So we can introduce this object. Uh, so the, the, the drift is given by the gradient of the action. And we, so the gradient of the action is complex and we take the absolute value of this and, and normalize by the number of lattices and take the square root. And we look for the probability distribution of this object, u. So it is given by p of u. And uh, we so this probability distribution should, uh, should be suppressed exponentially at larger magnitudes. Uh, so that would guarantee the correctness of the complex Langevin method. So again, we looked at how fast this probability distribution decays. And they are all decaying exponentially. And we can justify uh, the use of the complex Langevin method. So in, there are certain parameter uh, regions where it doesn't decay exponentially. So in those regions, we cannot trust the results coming from complex Langevin method. So, so while doing simulations, um, we should always uh, check these things since we, you know, we don't know how to, uh, what the, the equilibrium distribution, the two dimensional distribution is. Okay, now moving on to the second application, which is uh, IKKT matrix model in the context of string theory. Uh, so this is a work in progress uh, with Arpit and Piyush. Uh, so Arpit, as I mentioned before, he's doing his postdoc at uh, Central China Normal University. In, and uh, Piyush is doing his PhD at the University of Wuppertal. Uh, so Piyush was my master's student at uh, Aysar Mohali. Uh, so part of the work, uh, appeared in the uh, proceedings of the Lattice Conference in 2023. Um, so coming to IKKT matrix model, so this model was proposed as a non perturbative formulation of superstring theory. Uh, so here, this is a matrix model. So everything is happening at one space-time point and the space-time emerges uh, dynamically from the eigenvalues of the bosonic matrices of this model in the large end limit. Um, so the, the scenario of uh, dynamical compactification, so why uh, four directions are large and why six directions are small, um, so that can be understood as a purely non perturbative effect. So now the coming to the IKKT matrix model, so this model contains a description of an arbitrary number of D objects. Uh, so they, they could be D0, D1, D2, like that. Um, so in a matrix, the block diagonal entries are interpreted as D objects and uh, off diagonal entries are interactions between these D objects. Now, the question is, why are there three large spatial dimensions? Uh, so three directions are expanding or they are large and three directions are compactified. So why is, why is it so? Why is it happening? So hopefully IKKT matrix model 
might tell us something about this. Uh, so before that, let's see where this model is coming from. Uh, so this model is coming from uh, dimensionally reducing the 10 dimensional supersymmetric Yang mills, which is n equal to one super Yang mills in 10 dimensions uh, to a point. Uh, so this model, it contains large number of degrees of freedom. They are matrices. Uh, so there are 10 scalars and 16 fermions, and all of them are n by n matrices. And we are taking the large n limit of this. So the action of the aggregate matrix model, it has this particular form. So there is a bosonic part and there is a fermionic part. Uh, so these gamma matrices are 10 dimensional gamma matrices. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned before, uh, so there is a coupling G, uh, this coupling can be absorbed into the fields. So technically there is no coupling. Uh, so what are the symmetries of this model? So it has a supersymmetry. There are 16 uh, supersymmetries. Um, and uh, it has SUN gauge symmetry. So there is a gauge transformation where this, the scalars and, uh, sorry, the matrix valued fields and uh, the fermions, they transform in this way. And it also has an SO10 rotational symmetry, which is nothing but the Lorentz symmetry of the 10 dimensional theory. So we can uh, flip the scalars uh, we can rotate the scalars and uh, the action is invariant under the rotation. Um, so now the dynamical compactification, so why three directions are large and why six directions are small, it is coming, it is realized via the spontaneous symmetry breaking of this SO10 symmetry of the model. So the SO10 symmetry of the model where the action, it is visible in the action, in the form of the action, uh, this symmetry can break into two subgroups. One is SOD and the other is 10 minus D. So the question we want to ask is, is it breaking into say SO3 cross SO7 or something else? So we can write uh, the partition function of this model in this way, uh, where the action is the action of the aggregative model. Uh, so here also we can integrate over the Grassmann variables and uh, what we get is a Fafian instead of a determinant. Fafian is a square root of the determinant. Um, and uh, uh, we can write the partition function as exponential of an effective action. So we can bring the uh, Fafian to the, to the exponential by introducing a log. So the effective action has this particular form. So here, this matrix M, it is the fermion operator. Uh, it is 16 times n squared minus one uh, times 16 times n squared minus one size matrix. Here 16 is coming from the 16 fermions and n squared minus one is coming from SUN. Uh, so the, the matrix M, it can be complex in general. So it causes a sign problem in Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, so it's the same with the BFSS matrix model, which is a matrix quantum mechanics. Uh, if we dimensionally reduce the BFSS matrix model to uh, a space, to a space-time point, what we get is the IKKD matrix model. So we can write the Fafian in this way, um, a real part and a phase. Uh, so if the phase is close to zero, we can do Monte Carlo simulations. We can do the phase reweighting and everything. Uh, but uh, if the phase is large, then that is a problem. So in this particular case, the phase alpha, it fluctuates widely when D is large within this SOD. Um, then what we can, I mean, people have done Monte Carlo with the phase quenched. It is done in this reference in 2015. And they found that no spontaneous symmetry breaking in the phase quenched uh, model. And uh, we can do Monte Carlo and uh, real line one for bosonic part of the AKKT. And people have done this and they are also no uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking in the model. So it has, so it, it is hinting that the phase of the Fafian, it plays a role uh, if there is a symmetry breaking. Now we can apply the complex Langevin method to IKKT matrix model. So we have matrix degrees of freedom here. Uh, so the Langevin process is, is the same. It looks the same, but there are more number of degrees of freedom. So then uh, discretize the Lange 1 equation. So this is the discretized version of the evolution. Um, then there is a step size, which is coming from the numerical integration. 
And uh, what we do is we use an adaptive step size to make the evolution stable and uh, make it make the convergence faster. So it was introduced in this reference in 2010, adaptive step size. Now here also we need to look for the correctness uh, criteria for the complex angiogram method. So a priori, uh, we don't know whether the simulations are reliable or not. So there can be problems. One is the excursion problem. So the field variables can wander off to infinity in the imaginary direction. So that is the excursion problem. Then there is a singular drift problem. Uh, the fermion eigenvalues can accumulate near zero and it creates a problem when we invert the fermion matrix. So as part of the evolution, we need to invert the fermion operator. Now we need to control the excursions into the imaginary directions. So here, what we can do is we, we can introduce something called gauge cooling. It was introduced in this reference in 2013. Uh, so what we do is we track the deviation of the matrix, the non-hermitian matrix from hermeticity using this, uh, this hermeticity norm. So it, it says how far this thing is, this matrix X mu, how far is it from the hermitian X mu? Now, what we can do is uh, under gauge cooling, we are trying to bring the configuration as close to SUN as possible. So there are gauge orbits, as you can see or on the figure on the right-hand side. So these are gauge orbits on the left-hand side. We can do a gauge transformation and bring uh, the configuration to SUN. Um, I mean, everything is in SUN here on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side, the the group is enhanced to SLNC because of the complex matrices. And uh, we can do a transformation uh, so that we can bring it as close to SUN as possible. So that is essentially what gauge cooling does. So we minimize the deviation from hermeticity. So this is the process we need to, we can ex expand the, the, gauge, the element of the group as exponential mi minus alpha, uh, F of a TA, and here for SLNC, this F of A is complex, the coefficients. But for SUN, the coefficients are real. Uh, so we can pick a particular di direction like a gradient, uh, which, uh, which helps us in reaching this configuration where uh, it is closer to SUN. So that is the idea of uh, gauge cooling. So we can do that to avoid the excursion problem, then uh, do the Langevin evolution through gauge cooling. Uh, then here alpha is a parameter uh, we introduce here in the exponential, which, uh, which can be a constant or adaptive. So simulations in literature show that uh, adaptive um, alpha, it gives a much faster evolution towards hermeticity. So in our model, we checked uh, whether the hermeticity norm under control uh, and they are under control. So these are preliminary investigations uh, so a paper will be out soon. Uh, now the next problem is the singular drift problem. So th this problem happens when eigenvalues of the fermion operator, uh, they accumulate uh, too close to zero. And in the gradient of the fermionic action, we see the, the inverse of the fermion operator. If the eigenvalues are close to zero, then the inversion uh, is very difficult numerically. So what we do is we can avoid a small mass term to the fermions and so that they don't accumulate close to zero and we can easily do the fermion matrix inversion. Okay, now in order to uh, reduce this, uh, the effect of this problem, what we do is we modify the IKKT model. So we add certain terms, certain deformation terms. And in our case, these deformation terms, they respect supersymmetry. So we add supersymmetric deformation terms. Um, and so this is the structure of the deformation term. It is given in this uh, work by Bonelli uh, in 2002. Uh, so it, is a, it has a unique structure. Uh, so introduce the deformation terms, then we, have, we can look at the bosonic IKKT model uh, so it has three kinds of deformation terms, but they all respect supersymmetry when we upgrade this model to the, the full IKKT model. Um, now, so when, so the deformation, it breaks the SO10 symmetry. 
So it explicitly breaks SO10 to SO7 cross SO3. Uh, the structure of the deformation terms uh, is in that way. Uh, but as we reduce the deformation to zero, then we should have SO10 symmetry recovered. Then uh, the fermion operator, uh, it takes this particular form. So here, omega controls the amount of deformation. Uh, so the, the mass term, the deformation term, it shifts the eigenvalue distribution of the fermion matrix. Uh, so here, there are three plots on the left-hand side. Uh, so we have the case where the fermion eigenvalues are distributed, the real and imaginary parts, for the case uh, deformation equal to zero. So we can see that there is a, an accumulation of eigenvalues in the zero at the origin. Uh, as we introduce the deformation parameter, we can see that uh, the eigenvalues are moving away from zero. Um, and uh, as we increase the amount of deformation, they are shifting further and further away from zero. Now, what are the observables of this theory? So we can use an observable, which is called the radial extent of eigenvalues to probe spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking in this model. So the, this observable is constructed from the scalar fields of the theory in this particular way. Uh, so what we do is uh, we normalize this observable um, because um, the, the eigenvalues, it depends on the deformation parameter as uh, as inverse, uh, proportional to the inverse of the deformation parameter. So when omega going to zero, uh, there are artifacts and we want to get rid of those artifacts. So that is why we normalize this observable. Okay, so then the plan of action is uh, simulate the theory with uh, non-zero deformation, then large and extrapolation. Um, at non-zero deformation, we must have the rotational symmetry spontaneously, uh, sorry, explicitly broken. Then we take omega into zero, which def uh, which gives the undeformed IKKD model and uh, look at the observables, uh, the, the extent of the scalars and see if SO10 is uh, recovered. I mean, SO10 is broken or not. So we can look at uh, the bosonic part of the IKKD model first. Um, so it is given by this, and this model exhibits no spontaneous symmetry breaking of the certain symmetry. Uh, so it was shown using Monte Carlo and also using one over D expansion. So these are our simulation results for the bosonic uh, model. So we can see that uh, for large omega values, there is a clear separation of the, uh, the extents. So there is a breaking into SO3 uh, cross SO7. But as we decrease omega, they are coming together. And for small omega values, this SO10 symmetry is recovered. So there is no spontaneous symmetry breaking in bosonic IGKD model. As the mass deformation goes to zero, this SO10 symmetry is recovered. So that is, we can see that um, in the region where omega is between zero and five. So they are kind of on top of each other. Now we can look at uh, how the extent changes as we change the number of colors, uh, the size of the matrix. So the analytical value at large n, it is given by this uh, value. It is coming from this one over d expansion. And in our case, d equal to 10, we got, because we have 10 scalars. And uh, our numerical simulations, it, uh, it shows that uh, the, the lambdas are approaching this analytical value as um, as we increase n, the size of the matrix, which is a good sign. Now we can also check the expectation value of the, the bosonic action. So this is, so the bosonic action, it should fluctuate around 2.5 according to this uh, uh, result from one over D expansion, um, the large N results. So here also in our simulations, we see that the bosonic action fluctuates around this value. So spontaneous symmetry breaking is absent. Um, in this bosonic IKKT model. Now, coming to the full IKKT model uh, results, uh, we see a clear separation. Um, so six, uh, seven eigenvalues are kind of together and three eigenvalues are kind of together. And this is for deformation value omega equal to five. Um, and this is for number of colors equal to six. 
Um, so what is interesting is as we change omega, uh, these eigenvalues uh, uh, distributions are changing their behavior. So they are some of them are moving up, some of them are, are moving down. So our goal is to decrease omega further and increase uh, the value of n and see whether we get uh, SO10 or whether SO10 is broken into uh, some smaller groups. Um, so, so here what we see is there is a clear breaking of SO, SO, uh, of SO10 symmetry into SO7 cross SO3. That is expected because our the mass deformation has that symmetry breaking in there explicitly. Uh, so the question is when the mass uh, deform the deformation terms when they go to zero, what do we get? That is a question. Uh, so even for n equal to six, we see that the extents are not the same. As we change omega, uh, they are changing their behavior. So it hints at uh, SO10 going to SOD cross SO10 minus D and uh, with SOD less than seven. So that is what we are seeing. So the simulations are still ongoing. This is a preliminary result. Um, so we are doing simulations where the omega value is going towards zero and for larger values of n. Okay, so now let me move on to the lipschitz thimble method. Uh, so how much uh, more time do I have, Prasad? We started a little late, so you have 10 minutes more, I mean. Okay, okay, all right. Um, so from complex lunch one, let me suddenly change gears and uh, go to lipschitz thimble method. Uh, so this is, um, the results I'm going to show is based on the work done with uh, Bharat Kumar. Uh, Bharat is, uh, he was a master's student at Aysar Mohali. Now he's doing his PhD at the University of Geneva. Uh, so this was the, the summer project, I think. I gave, I gave him a summer project and it stand out to be you know, this paper. Um, so Lipschitz thimbles, uh, it is a generalization of the steepest descent method, which we encounter in uh, math methods, mathematical methods in physics course. Uh, so we generalize the steepest descent method. Uh, so here, what we do is we deform the integration contour such that uh, the imaginary part of uh, the action remains constant. So, so here, here is a sketch on the right hand side. We have suppose we we want to integrate over this uh, field configuration phi r. So the field phi is real, and we want to integrate from say minus infinity to plus infinity integral d phi. Phi is the same as phi r, but the action is complex. So as uh, as we change phi, the value of the action also changes the real and imaginary parts of the action. So now we want to look for a deformed contour. So we want to we want to deform this contour into the complex plane um, such that along this contour, as we move along this contour, the imaginary part of the action remains constant. It doesn't change. So can we find such a contour? Uh, so that contour is called the Lipschitz thimble, simply speaking. So it's just a, a change of variables. We are going into the, the into the complex plane. So th basically this is the same thing uh, what we study in the complex analysis in math methods course. So cauchy riemann conditions are satisfied and we can push the contour as long as we don't encounter any singularities, any poles or branch cuts along the way. Uh, everything should be fine. It should give the same uh, result. Okay, now uh, along this contour, this contour is called the Lipschitz thimble. The, the phase exponential of the imaginary part of the action times i, that phase is constant. So we can take that out of the path integral. So that is the whole idea. But there is still uh, a residual phase, uh, which is called the mi mild sign problem. It doesn't uh, grow with uh, the volume, uh, exponential of the volume. Uh, so that's why it's called a mild sign problem. And this is coming from the curvature of the thimble. So we want to parameterize the thimble using some parameter, some variable, and that brings a Jacobian and this Jacobian is complex. So it gives a, a mild sign problem. Now, how do we construct uh, the thimble? So let's uh, here also consider a theory with a one degree of freedom. So the path integral is given by this. 
the, the real field is going from minus infinity to plus infinity, then exponential minus of the action. And this action is complex. Now, again, similar to the pathological approach, the observables are given computed uh, in this way. Now we extend the field variable to the complex plane. So phi is continued to phi real plus i times phi i. Uh, and let's assume that the action is holomorphic when we do this. Um, now let's consider a simple case where this action has a single non-degenerate critical point, which is denoted as phi naught. Uh, so we take the derivative of the action and we find the critical point and there is only one critical point, which is not degenerate. Now the thimble, which we denote as J naught, which is a curve, and it is given by this particular requirement, imaginary part of the action on this curve J naught, which is which must be equal to the imaginary part of the action when the field value is at the critical point. Um, and uh, along the curve, that part should remain constant. So this one dimensional path, J naught, it passes through the critical point. Uh, and we can find that path through this differential equation. So rate of change of this field phi with respect to a fictitious a, a parameter t. We parameterize phi with the t, a parameter, equal to minus of the gradient of the action, but the complex conjugate of the entire thing. So this looks similar to the Langevin evolution, but um, there is a complex conjugate for the gradient of the action, and there is no noise term. So the car, the thimble, it ends at the critical point phi naught, as we as the fictitious variable, the parameter that uh, t, it goes to infinity. Then for every thimble, there is another object attached to that thimble at the critical point that is called the anti-thimble. So it is obtained by reversing the sign of the parameter t. Now, once we know the thimble, we can, so the contour has been deformed and we are integrating along the thimble. So we can express the observable in this way. Um, so the integral is not from minus infinity to plus infinity d phi, where phi is real. It is along this thimble j naught with uh, d phi. And uh, the partition function is given by this. And here we see that uh, the, the constant phase it is canceled because the, the same phase appears above and below, so they cancel. Um, so this is, once we know the thimble, we can evaluate uh, the, the, the observable along the thimble. Now, when there are more than one critical points, there will be a thimble and then and a thimble attached to each critical point. So we have lots of thimbles. So then we need to sum over all of them. So JK represents the kth thimble. Suppose we have two thimbles, then there'll be a J0 and a J1, two integration paths. And each one is multiplied by an integer. And this integer is called the, the intersection number. So basically this integer is one if the anti-thimble crosses the real line, the real integration contour. And uh, if the anti-thimble attached to the thimble crosses the in real integration contour. Otherwise, uh, it is zero. Now, the problem is uh, the phases no longer cancel when we have more than one thimbles because each thim thimble comes with the phase I mentioned uh, here, exponential minus i imaginary part of phi with phi is at phi k, where k is the kth critical point. So the phases uh, denote cancel. Uh, so then there is again a sign problem, but it is it is a mild design problem in the sense it doesn't blow up exponentially. Okay, now the work we did was we looked at uh, a model in zero dimensions, which is the simplest uh, non-trivial model we can we were able to come up with. Uh, so a model with a source term. So the action is given by this. So there is a scalar field and there are couplings. These, are, these couplings can be uh, complex. So sigma, lambda, h are in general complex. And uh, we express sigma as a plus ib, then lambda as c plus id. Um, and uh, the first thing is to look for the regions of stability. So here in this figure, we can see uh, four shaded regions. And these four shaded regions are coming because of the phi four. Uh, so these are the regions where the integral is convergent in the sense 
if a condor starts from this shaded region on the left and it ends in one of the three shaded regions, then that integral is a convergent integral. It doesn't blow up. But other integrals, suppose we have a contour, a curve, which starts from the shaded region, but ends at an unshaded region, then that integral is not convergent. So first thing is to find out this, the convergent regions of the integral. Uh, so here is an example for various parameter values. Then uh, the next is to find the thimbles. So the way to find the thimbles is uh, to look for solutions to this particular constraint. So we know the imaginary part of the action at the critical point. So here phi i is the critical value of the field. Uh, and uh, uh, we need to look for solutions where this particular constraint is satisfied. So when we do that, we get the thimbles and some of them are anti-thimbles. Uh, so this is the, the underlying thimble structure. So various, so there are three uh, critical points, uh, phi, phi naught, phi plus, phi minus. And uh, there are three thimbles associated with uh, three critical points and also three anti-thimbles. So we can see that uh, anti-thimbles, which are given by these uh, red dashed uh, lines, uh, they end in region, they start in region of instability and end in region of instability. That means that integral is not uh, convergent. And if you look at the thimble, which is this green curve, all of them are starting and ending in regions of stability. So those integrals are convergent integrals. Okay, so we looked at uh, the partition function and observables. So our, our plan was to scan the parameter uh, space and see whether there is any discontinuity in observables and partition function. And uh, here are certain examples where we find uh, such discontinuities, real and imaginary parts of the partition function and the absolute value. Then uh, for the observable uh, phi square, here also there is a kink um, for certain parameters. And uh, what we noticed is this discontinuity is coming from a change in the intersection number. So the way the, the thimbles are crossing, the anti-thimbles are crossing the, the real line. Um, so here for this parameter A, it, on the left-hand side, we have uh, A equal to plus one, and on the right-hand side, we have A equal to minus one. So the parameter A, the coupling A, it crosses through zero, and we see a, a drastic change in the thimble structure. And that change is uh, somehow manifested as this discontinuities in the partition function and uh, observables. So here is another plot uh, where we show the real part of the partition function, imaginary and the absolute values of the partition function. Again, there are discontinuities in the partition function indicating some kind of phase transitions in the theory. <clears throat> so yeah, these discontinuities, they suggest the existence of different phases. the boundaries of the phase transitions, <clears throat> excuse me, are uh, completely determined by these uh, couplings, sigma, lambda, and h. But uh, within the action, if there is a symmetry involving the field, that symmetry uh, would remain a symmetry of the model. So if you look at the model, if uh, whatever the symmetries the model has, those symmetries are unchanged. But uh, the observables and the partition function, they show some uh, strange non-analytic analytic behavior. Uh, so we, since this is in uh, in zero dimension, you know there is no notion of temperature, and uh, there is a phase transition. So we label this as quantum phase transitions in the theory. Now the next step is to study this model in higher dimensions say a one dimensional model that is the next uh, simplest possibility. So there we can introduce the notion of temperature. We can introduce uh, the, the time direction in the Euclidean theory as we introduce periodic boundary conditions and uh, the circumference of the, the, the temporal circle, it would serve as the uh, inverse temperature in the theory. And uh, we can study phase transitions in that model where we have temperature and also we have this quantum phases. So there will be an interplay of the of thermal phases and uh, quantum phases in the theory. So that would be the next uh, interesting thing to do. 
So with this, uh, let me give the final comments. Uh, so first, uh, I talked about complex lunch one method. So it is a useful tool to study models with uh, complex actions. Uh, we looked at examples, uh, supersymmetric quantum mechanics with various types of superpotentials, real and complex. And after that, we looked at the IKKT matrix model where the, the Fafian, the face of the Fafian can play a role in, in the spontaneous symmetry breaking of this SO10 rotational symmetry. Then we looked at uh, the bosonic IKKD model and showed that it has no spontaneous symmetry breaking in the large end limit. So it suggests that uh, the Fafian of the theory plays a crucial role in the SO10 symmetry breaking. Uh, so we find the presence of spontaneous symmetry breaking in full IKKD model, but the results are preliminary larger end simulations are ongoing. Uh, then we showed uh, a toy model on thimbles, uh, and uh, we concluded that the discontinuity in the partition function and observables, um, they, they are tied to this, uh, to a drastic change in the structure of the thimble. So, and that in turn that we connected that to the quantum phases in the theory. Uh, so the next step would be to study the thimbles in higher dimensional models. Uh, in finite temperature field theories, where we have thermal phases and quantum phases. Uh, so with that, uh, let me finish. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Anush. Thanks a lot. I, yeah, it was a very informative talk. Uh, before, yeah, before we proceed, so does anyone have any questions? I see Sachin has raised his hand. He has a question. <laughs> Hi, uh, Anush. I had a quick question about Hi. the yeah. uh, explicit symmetry breaking terms that you mentioned in the yes. study of IKKT. Yeah. Mm. So you chose a symmetry breaking term which broke it uh, the symmetry to uh, SO7 cross SO3. Right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, but there are other possibilities also. You can take uh, SO5 cross SO5. Yes, SO... but those possibilities would not be supersymmetry preserving. So right, picked, but uh, uh, but you yeah. anyway looked at it in the purely bosonic model, isn't it? Right. So yeah. in the purely bosonic model, presumably one could study those and see whether. Um, yeah. Yes. Ex yeah. Yes. One could. Uh, one could give say 10 different mass terms and uh, you know for the 10 scalars um, which would be you know and see whether they all approach to the same, uh, same well, uh, i'm, that I'm not a... proposing that you do take the hardest <laughs> that is what, yeah we have we yeah we have thought but, about uh, that. but yeah. there are i mean the other, uh, all i wanted to ask is uh, aren't those mm -hmm. other symmetry breaking terms uh, on a similar footing as this one, at least when you're looking at this, the bosonic. Uh, uh, bosonic, yes, I would agree because there is no supersymmetry. So we search for uh, mass terms that preserve supersymmetry. And, uh, you know, we ended up this particular mass term, which is given in this uh, Bonnelli's work, uh, which is a unique mass term. It, it preserves all the supersymmetries. So, um, so there are, if you want to preserve supersymmetry, there's no other choice, is it? Is it? There is no other choice that uh, we are no, yeah, we are aware of. There okay. is no other choice. So uh, we we thought it would be nice to preserve supersymmetry and do all these simulations. Right. Um, yeah. Another option is you know introduce some random mass terms and you know yeah. and uh, so, take the limit where all these mass terms go to zero and see if you recover. Um, yeah, so that is also something on the horizon, but it will take a lot of time, you know, simulation wise. Right, right. You have to keep track of so many parameters. Yeah. Okay, yeah so here thanks. there is only one parameter, one common deformation parameter. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Uh, maybe I can start. Maybe I can start and someone yeah, else might yeah, follow. Sure. Um, so, Anush, I had some general yeah. questions also, but maybe we first uh, ask a couple of technical questions. Uh, so, yeah. this would be a naive question. What's the critical point of an action? Uh, so, you take the derivative with respect to the field. I mean, similar to how we find the critical points, right? The um, we take the derivative What's of the, the, the actions. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Ah, yeah. Okay. And 
yeah and uh, if, if you want to find the node degenerate then uh, second derivative you know as yeah, to you, usual, you know or non zero second it's, it's, no degenerate, no non degenerate. Um, so we looked at uh, a case where there is only one single critical point. I mean, to make the discussion easier. Um, okay. Yeah. So, it's basically uh, the the steepest descent, steepest descent approach. Okay. Ah. Okay. 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 That's now I'm remembering. Okay. Okay. I yeah. The sad. The saddle point. Yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, what are ghosts? I think you had something about ghosts on that last night. <laughs> Oh, did I mention ghosts? You that, didn't that think is... about it, but it was there. I mean, yeah, the ghosts are the solutions. Uh, they are not thimbles, not anti thimbles. Uh, mm -hmm. So they, where are they? So they end uh, in, you know, one side is region of stability and the other side is region of uh, yeah, yeah. instability. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so for uh, this gray curve, it is a ghost. Uh, so one side it is a region of stability, and the other side, you know, it ends in an unstable region. Unstable. unstable. Yeah, it's not a thimble. It's not an anti thimble, but it appears as part of the solution set. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. So we call that them. That also goals. has to be excluded. That also has to be excluded. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. And they don't pass through the critical points. Only thimbles and anti thimbles pass through the critical point. Hmm. They intersect at a critical point. If you look at the middle figure, you can see that uh, at, at the origin, thimble and anti thimble are crossing. Just uh, that, is, that is the critical point. So the anti thimble is just the time reversed, uh, you know, evolution of the thimble, right? So why is uh, it the parameterization? Curve? Yeah, yeah. Why isn't it the same curve? I thought it would be the same curve. You have to traverse it in the opposite direction. Um, uh, you know, the parametric expression changes. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, yeah, another way to look at is you ask, uh, how does the real part of the action change? Exponential minus real part of S. Mm -hmm. uh, so on along anti thimble, uh, it becomes negative. So that the entire thing blows up. Exponential minus real part of the action. It blows up at infinity so that the integral is not convergent. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, okay, okay. And one more small technical point in uh, complex large one. I mean, yeah. so there's a constraint for the noise, right? That nr minus ni has to Yes, be. yeah, yeah. And also, I think there is some delta function constraint. Is it delta theta minus theta prime or something? So I think at different times, uh, it has to be different or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have to be different. But yeah. other than that, yeah. you're free to choose the noise anyway. I mean, yeah, you are free to, yeah, it has to be a Gaussian noise. Oh, it has uh, to be Gaussian. With, yeah, yeah, Gaussian with width Gaussian. two, huh? mean zero and width two. Oh, oh, oh. So this uh, this is coming from something called Eto calculus. Okay. Uh, so more details are there mm -hmm. if you uh -huh. look for it. So that's yeah. actually that was my question. So you cannot choose Z2 yeah. or something like that. That's not allowed. No, no. It has to be Gaussian. Gaussian. Yeah. Okay, okay. Because um, in the evolution you will do. Um, you interchange between uh, this uh, Langevin evolution and uh, you do you mix the inter interchange the two averages the, you know ensemble average and the uh, the average coming from this noise uh -huh. uh, you know to show that uh, it's ergodic uh, you have to show that uh, the ergodicity still holds yeah so for that this delta nature should be there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, answer to your question is it has to be a Gaussian noise. Gaussian, Gaussian. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And one last, and this is a general question. So you yeah. studied both these methods. You studied complex Langevin for the sign problem, and you've studied Lipschitz symbol also for the sign. Lipschitz um, uh, yeah, symbol. Right? A simple model. We, you know, we started looking at uh, you know a simple non-trivial model just to understand what's happening in yeah. Uh, so, but complex Langevin, we have produced uh, more papers. We have made much more progress in complex Langevin. Yeah. So, I mean, according to you, so what are the like you know like the advantages and disadvantages of each method? Like, I mean, is there something um, with complex Langevin is does better? Yeah, uh, lift, I mean, the problem is uh, for lifted thimbles, the disadvantage is finding the thimbles as you increase the number of space-time dimensions. 
the question is how do you find the thimble for example qcd finding the thimble is extremely difficult uh, then you have to stay on the thimble in your you know simulations uh, but complex land join it is straightforward it is easy to do it's straightforward but again the the problem is you don't know whether it's going to give the correct results or not so you have to keep track of this reliability conditions and all those things. It's the deviation from hermeticity and things like that. Yeah, all those things. You have to keep track of all those things. But simulation-wise, complex range one is very easy. Um, lifted thimbles is simulation-wise difficult, but it's more robust. It is, it has, you know, once you find the thimble, then you can do a Monte Carlo on the thimble. You stay on the thimble and do Monte Carlo because action is real on the thimble as long as you stay there. So if you can find the thimble, it's really very advantageous. I mean, it's a very good yeah. thing because yeah. you effectively yeah. solve the same problem. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, people are looking at like uh, using machine learning to find the thimble manifold. Mm -hmm. So finding the thimble is finding a manifold with certain you know constraints. So you can do you know machine learning to learn the manifold. And uh, once you know, you can do Monte Carlo on that manifold. So, uh, I mean, there are, people are working on this. Um, yeah, so those directions are open. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So, I see, I see. So, I mean, going ahead, I mean, like you think uh, Lipschitz symbols might uh, uh, like go ahead of uh, complex Langevin? I mean, if... Uh, um. I, I don't know. I don't know. If we can do QCD with chemical potential, you know, on a thimble, that would be great. You know, it would be, it would be a robust uh, calculation, numerical as well. Yeah. So, yeah, with this uh, computing advantages, I mean, it should be possible, I guess. Yeah. It should be easier. Do we have any other questions? Does anyone else have any questions? Um, I don't see any. I don't see any, Anush. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. No, we're happy. We're happy and uh, good to see you again. I mean, uh, like I said, you know, it's been a while. So, uh, yeah, it was nice, you know, nice having you. And uh, hope to hear, you know, more talks from you in the future as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. Gaurav, I guess, uh, yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah. Uh, Gaurav, yeah, you can, uh, you can close, you can close this session. Ah, Prasad, you, you continue. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess the uh, only thing to say is that, you know, we will be uploading this talk. There'll probably yeah. be a delay of a few days, but we'll upload mm -hmm. these talks to the CHEP website. Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyone who has okay. missed it uh, can, you know, yeah. also view the talk there. And we send yeah. another reminder as well as soon as the talk is uploaded. Okay, excellent. So that uh, I guess we close and Anosh, yeah, we have one more talk uh, coming up. We will mm -hmm. send a formal announcement uh, that's mm -hmm. around uh, 22nd December. Uh, that's yeah. uh, Job Feldbrugger. But mm -hmm. uh, that'll be the last talk for this year. So uh, uh, with you, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. And <laughs> Wish yeah, yeah, yeah. You Wishing you the day. same. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy the holidays. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.